Who was from sending these viruses to well, you and from where? The, the, the nucleus of them uh, came from the field laboratories of the Rockefeller Foundation. We were in, in New York at the time uh, at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research where our laboratory, the, the Rockefeller Foundation, was located. We were the <coughs> reference or the, or the clearinghouse for all the field laboratories. We were supposed to help them both by doing tests for them and at the same time developing better procedures if necessary so that they could use them. They began to use, for example, the, the newborn mouse. Every one of these different laboratories uh, had uh, the first thing that they did was to establish a mouse colony and have uh, a, a supply of newborn mice because of the, uh, of the advantages of that animal as compared with an with a, uh, adult mouse. Uh, and then... Uh, and the chicken, which and is the also used, baby chicken. The baby chicken. Oh well, yes, that was another another problem, another question. That the the red cell that we used as an indicator was the one day old chicken, as had been used by, well, by uh, Hearst with the influenza, and of course, then by uh, Sabin and uh, Busher for the f first few of the arboviruses. Uh, we had to have that, and that was a bit of a problem because you had to bleed innumerable chickens to have enough and bleed them once a week. The, the chick <laughs> either size don't last long, even though put in some uh, solutions to preserve them. And here is where uh, uh, necessity was the, the, the mother of invention. Not in our case, Porterfield, whom I dearly like, uh, he's a great man. He was stationed somewhere in the, in in West Africa and Lagos doing other things among these. And uh, I guess he was short of one day old chickens and anyway that was the sort of thing you couldn't do, kill chickens <laughs> that would become hens or right. <laughs> roosters uh, where, where they didn't have much protein. So he must have seen a, a, a goose walk up and down and decided to try the goose. And that, that was really a remarkable thing because there is no doubt that the goose sell adult goose or you have three geese, you bleed them all once a month and you have cells to, to test any number of viruses that come along. Who sent us materials? We had them from South Africa. Uh, Ken Smithburn was the representative uh, uh, of the Rockefeller Foundation at that laboratory and, and he would send us viruses isolated not just in, in what was then the Republic of South, or, or South Africa, but also Mozambique and uh, I think even Madagascar, though the French uh, Pasteur Institute uh, had to say there. But it covered more than just what is South Africa. Uh, then there were some that came from, from uh, Nigeria. There was no laboratory in Nigeria to begin with, but subsequently Otis Kozi and Callista appeared in Ibadan, and they isolated mm, viruses by the dozen. I mean, there is mm -hmm. <laughs> in Arbor viruses pre Kozi and after Kozi, <laughs> where they appeared, there were a lot uh, of viruses. They skewed in some ways the, the isolation of viruses because, as you realize, where were they isolated? Well, where the causes were. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> by, the, uh, by the late 60s, when you had done uh, all of this cross-reactivity and uh, things were slowing down yeah, as far as uh, discovering new viruses and yeah. classification was concerned, uh, Fred Murth Murphy and others came along and began to look at these viruses by right, electron right, microscopy, right, yes. and they kept <coughs> saying, Every time Dr. Casals says these two are related, they look alike. <laughs> and yeah. it turned out that there was a correlation between yeah, uh, electron yeah. microscopy and serology and later biochemistry. And biochemistry. And serology, yeah. which led everyone into uh, taxonomy. Yeah, that's right. That, that uh, made sense. That is to say, we now know that there are families, the alpha there, the, the, the flava there, and so on. Uh, that have certain properties and we are and they are related antigenically. Well the historical record shows that the antigenicity was proved first mm -hmm. and then followed the other things. Uh, with rare exceptions, there was a virus that uh, uh, 
Phil Russell and his group found in, 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 in Southeast Asia, and they, on morphology and properties, put it among the Bunyan Buera, and that we could never hang it onto King anything, Koi King Koi virus. Yeah. Well, it's not yeah. over yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were very acrimonious debates about that as to what the name of the viruses would have to be. And uh, that's, we, we put together in, in, in an article in, in one of the comparative uh, uh, virology that uh, our friend uh, Kurstad published, uh, 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 an incorporation of the arboviruses in a general uh, system of classification. And there I used for the first time, it's funny, I paid through the nose to send my daughter to a fancy school, and those were the days of the new math, you know, sets. You deal in sets, the theory of sets. And the only money I got out of that is that I used the theory of sets, making <laughs> circles and overlapping. <laughs> 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 I felt very good. Yeah. I told Hanun in France about this. Oh, la théorie d'ensemble. <laughs> he knew it right away. It became general, yeah. Anyway, the, the, the arbor virus, the viruses is like, like this square, you put a circle, this is the arthropod-borne virus and circles that are included in or part of it or not at all. And that's what explains that one a virus can be at the same time arbovirus and, and alpha or, or flavia. I mean, the, the and of course you can have anything. viruses which are not arthropod born but which Should are antigenically and genetically related, related to those oh which yes, are. Surely that's right. Uh, they, they would not bite into the, into the circle represented the arboviruses but they, they would be among the, call, call them whatever they are. What was the, the purpose of your trips to the Soviet Union? Or the purposes. The purposes, yeah. Uh, there was at, at the time uh, uh, an, an, a scientific and cultural exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union, the purpose of which was to bring specialists on certain uh, problems uh, in the United States to the Soviet Union so that we could see what they were doing on that field, advise them, and vice versa. They would come here and tell us what they were doing and, uh, and uh, look into what we were doing. Now, that had been going on for several years, as far as I remember, so that uh, when it came to, to the uh, hemorrhagic fevers, that was a big problem at one time, and still is in the Soviet Union, perhaps not so much the Omsk hemorrhagic fever and the Congo Crimean, although at that time they still were having cases of it, but they had what they called the, uh, uh, hemorrhagic fever with uh, renal syndrome, of which they had uh, very serious outbreaks in the in the Far East, in the area of Vladivostok and, and that area, and then in the European part of the Soviet Union. Well, <coughs> the, the Soviets requested that some people be sent that knew about these matters, viral uh, hemorrhagic fevers and uh, uh, arboviruses in general, not respiratory or any kind of viruses. That was a separate, a separate uh, a mission. I think the one that came before us were dealing with that. So that's the reason why we went mainly to tell them what we were doing on those fields of hemorrhagic fevers, arbovirology, explain, uh, as I've been doing here, for example, what were our aims and what we had hoped to accomplish. And at the same time, to see the, the the locale on which these uh, uh, diseases, hemorrhagic fevers, occurred. Uh, after all, we've learned just from reading in books, we didn't know what the tiger looked like or where the, the, delta, the, the delta of the Volga River looked like where some cases occurred. So th in that way was very productive. Where they took us all over the Soviet Union, including areas in which no, 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 no foreigner, that is, non Soviet had ever been. Now the question that in, in my mind I'm beginning to wonder whether vaccines, even supposing vaccines are good, efficient uh, and all that, how are you going to administer vaccines in the case of arbovirus? That was always my, my problem and that's why we did sometimes some work. How soon after vaccination will the immune response appear? In other words, can you vaccinate in the face of an epidemic when yeah. a number of people may be already infected? Well, I thought it was worthwhile, but we found out that the immune response 
are detected by methods that really are crude, what you think of it. Hemagglutination inhibition, immunofluorescence, and neutralization tests <coughs> seem to appear within, within 24 or 48 hours. So that means that if the index case or several cases appear of yellow fever, you can vaccinate that population and prevent a great deal of infection. But uh, w what, uh, how many vaccines are you going to give and to whom? That, that's always my, my question. Well, in the case of dengue, yes, perhaps you could prevent a serious illness, dengue uh, uh, shock syndrome, but you would have to vaccinate really with a good vaccine because otherwise you may be sensitizing some of the people. I, I have been wondering, and, and that might be, I know that there is some money being put into it, the use of, of the treatment following exposure, following infection, that is chemotherapy. Well, that's a, that's a big, <laughs> big problem. That's the one that I consider should be a, a addressed at this point. You've received the uh, yeah, Richard I, M. Taylor Award? I, I was given the, the Taylor Award the first year, when first time went to Dr. Taylor himself, and the second time came to me. And uh, that was a record. I had no, no inkling about it. I mean, even, even it, it was the, uh, Bill Reeves who gave it to me, and he said to me, oh, I knew you, you had no suspicion whatsoever. Uh, that, that you were that award is for long and outstanding contributions to the field of virology, are, of, uh, of, are, of virology, of virology particularly. Yeah, that's right. And another uh, award they gave me uh, that must have been about the same time. I forget the year. The Kimball Methodology Award, the American Public Health Association, uh, for contribution uh, uh, to methods and techniques for uh, handling these viruses. One, one distinction I'm very proud of is that I was made a, an honorary uh, fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine, and uh, that, that was Gordon Smith, and That's he sent nice. me a little piece of paper and said, look, you're coming, and there was Koch, and Austin Chamberlain was one of them, and really very notorious <laughs> individuals, or oh, famous ones, so, famous. That, that, yeah, <laughs> so that was good. Oops. Recently, I just heard from the, uh, the president of the French Society of Microbiology, the Francis Microbiology, that, that they made me an honorary fellow or member, and they called him Membre d'Honneur. And I think that was Anun who did it. Yeah. You get a ribbon. You get a ribbon <laughs> and a kiss <laughs> on both cheeks. <laughs> okay. yeah, it came by mail. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the What's the, the, uh, the most rewarding aspect of having done all of this work over all these years for you? Yeah, that's hard to tell. I, I, I know what it is. I mean, having met the people that were my uh, colleagues and collaborators and friends, that to me has meant more than anything I have discovered. 